Camping in the middle of nowhere with some friends, to many, sounds like a perfect little getaway. But be wary, as you never know who could be out there with you, just waiting to let the darkness take control. I am a big wilderness buff. At times, I've spent weeks in the wilderness, camping, surveying, foraging for edibles, typical wilderness stuff. Usually, I like to bring a trek buddy, just because of the safety factor. This time, however, I did not. Nobody wanted to go camping. So a few years ago, I was out camping in Northern Oregon. Everything was quite regular, insects being a constant pest, the occasional rattle of a bush when a small animal became startled. Nothing I'm not used to. I had planned to stay for at least a week, I had more than enough supplies. On my first night, after I set up camp, it was pretty quiet until about midnight. If you've ever been camping in the deep woods, you know how dark it can get. With only the fire pit and a half dead flashlight for light, as I forgot to bring spare batteries. As I'm sitting at my campsite, reading a novel by one of my favourite authors, I hear movement in the shrubs, just outside the perimeter of my campsite. Nothing I hadn't heard before. Small rustling. I just assumed it was a mouse, or some other small animal. And after listening, for any more sounds for another few minutes, and hearing nothing, I dismissed the noise. All was quiet for the whole of about ten minutes, before the loudest boom I've ever heard in my life rocks my camp. The force was enough to make my teeth clench. I've heard numerous guns fired, and nothing sounded like this. This was immediately followed by the most inhuman scream I've ever heard. Something like a mix of a small child and a wild animal. I promptly got up and ran to my tent. The sound of movement stopped completely after about an hour and a half, give or take a few minutes. I stayed awake the entire night, clutching my field knife in one hand facing the entrance of the tent. Nothing happened the rest of the night. The next morning, I got up and surveyed the area around my campsite. I couldn't find any tracks, human, animal, or otherwise. I cut my trip short and headed back to my car that morning. Me and my friend Annie we were about 22 at the time, and we were both at uni, in different cities. When we were kids, her family and mine used to go on hiking and camping trips every year. And through high school and uni, me and Annie kept up the tradition. We did bits and pieces of the West Highlands each year for a catch-up take some climbing shoes, and hang about a bit in the wilderness. We would usually do it at the start of summer. But, this year, we were both snowed under with work and exams and stuff, and couldn't get the time off. But the only time that we had enough days spare was mid-October. I was hesitating about heading up there right into the highlands that late into the year, and said that we should just miss it. But she laughed at me, and told me to grow a pair. So, October it was. You don't really argue with Annie. 
we met at a train station, about halfway up, and aimed for a three day hike. To be honest, I was kind of excited, even though I knew it would probably suck. I really love Annie, and I miss her when we're away. I saw her purple waterproofs, she dropped her bag, we hugged and started walking. We were chatting away about life. This was the year that she had gotten her first placement, as she's a doctor and found it difficult to get the time off. And I'd just restarted university and was trying to get my accommodation sorted. Either way, we were chatting for hours. Scottish weather is shite. I don't know if anyone has been here during the winter, but it sucks, especially later in the year. It gets dark by about 4pm and it rains almost every day. Apart from the days where it's moody and overcast and crappy or snowing. We Scots have a word for it. Dreish. Dark, shite weather. Can't see a thing and everyone is miserable. It was absolutely pissing it down with rain. And at the end of the day, we gave up. By the time we met at the station, it was about 10am and we forgot it got dark so early. So by the time the sun set, we only got about halfway to the place we usually stopped. We hiked along a bit further until I've had enough and told her I wasn't going to be putting up with it any further and it'd be cool if we just wild camped. So we pitch our tent on the first flat bit of land that we find, struggling in the dark, and then climbed in. Next morning we wake up, and we find out that we pitched the tent in a bog, about two feet from the burn, and literally everything was soaking wet. On top of that, we were miles and miles from the next train station, so we packed up raging and kept going. We discussed it a bit and in the end, we decided to head for a boothie that we knew was nearby, which at least had shelter. If you don't know what a boothie is, it's basically an open shed thing that you can sleep in with a bunch of other hikers, get to know folk and importantly, not have to worry about where to wild camp. Also, it's free, so you're not strung up by tourist hotel prices. We picked up the pace a lot and didn't really stop for food or anything because it's damp and sad anyway. Having left at 9am, we get there for around 3pm when the sun starts to set. It's dark and a bit grotty, but there's nobody else there so we feel like we've scored. By the time we've got dinner and played some torchlight cards, she's looking a bit spaced out. So she heads off to sleep early. I'm knackered and damp and I'm so glad to be somewhere dry. I just unpack my sleeping bag and do the same thing. Sometime in the middle of the night, I wake up to Annie having a seizure. It's not a big deal. This happens a lot. So I didn't need to call an ambulance or anything. I just jump up my sleeping bag and undo hers as she doesn't hurt herself. I sort of cushion her a bit with her fleece and keep an eye on her. She gets over the worst of it and she's laying there quiet whilst I'm talking to her as she comes round. At this point, I glanced up I noticed that sometime after we'd gone to bed, someone else had come to the boothie. There was a dark red bundle of sleeping bag in the corner and a rucksack, and Annie's fit had woken whoever it was. The guy was coming over to us. He seemed nice enough and genuinely worried. 
You need any help? He asks. I didn't get a chance to look him over, because I'm juggling making sure Annie's there okay, and making sure this guy doesn't call Mountain Rescue, and make us look like a bunch of tits. No, she's okay. It happens all the time. She's medicated and things. It just happens. She'll be alright soon. Sure? Yeah, honestly, thanks for your help. But we really can't do anything. He comes closer in order to start helping. Not in a way that immediately alerts me, but in an annoying way. Like... He starts trying to put her in recovery position, which I'd already done. And even though I told him a hundred times I've known her since I was five, and that I know what I'm doing, he didn't listen. He's breathing really heavily, and he smells a bit mouldy. Eventually I tell him to back off a bit, and give her some space, and then he smiles at me which was weird, and creepy, and in the half dark, it looked sort of wrong, because it didn't meet his eyes. This guy looks off as well. He's got a massive beard. Almost as if he lives out here in the wilderness, and a strange accent. I thought he may be an oil rigger or something. I've met a few in Aberdeen, and he seemed to fit the bill. His eyes were really, really dark, and his face was so pale that he made me look tanned. Also, who the hell is hiking in this weather? This late? Who gets a booty alone after 6pm? He moves closer again to look at Annie. Then I tell him more firmly that I've got her and that I don't need his help. I feel like I'm being a bit mean, but I'm starting to stress out because I can't see properly and Annie's been out for ages. By now, it's getting on to 15 or 20 minutes. It shouldn't take this long for her to come around. Like usually at least half this time. Also, I notice she's got her eyes open, which isn't that unusual, but I'm almost 90% sure she didn't when she started fitting. Then, I notice she's looking at me. Not zoned out or anything, but actually looking at me takes a few seconds for me to realise that she is. Lauren, she whispered, hardly moving her lips. She doesn't really blink either, but her eyes are looking right at mine. Don't react. I don't know why, but I'm so scared, and I just do what I'm told. She said once she had this patient, who used to talk bollocks a lot after a fit, like when they're hallucinating. So, a part of me thinks she was doing the same, but another part of me had noticed that she's now staring over my shoulder, where the red sleeping bag man was. I go to slowly turn around, but she grabs my hand. I put her in the recovery position, but from where she's lying, she's able to sort of squeeze my hand without moving too much. So I freeze, keep looking at her, and then keep my voice at normal volume. I don't know what else to do, so I keep talking to her, saying stuff like, Annie, it's me, can you hear me? Her eyes flicker back, and she whispers again, Lauren, ask him for help, ask him for help, don't panic. Okay, weird, really scared now. So I slowly let go of her hand and turn around, and that's when I see what she's been looking at. The red sleeping bag man has been sitting in a corner watching us, still smiling. Only now, he's got something in his hand under his jacket. I thought he'd got climbing gear with him, but all I can see is rope, and no harness or anything. And it's not climbing tape he's got. It's a massive roll of something darker. He's just staring at us, waiting. I don't know what else to do, so I move an inch or so away from her and look at this guy right in his creepy eyes. Hey, 
Sorry, mate. Can you give me a hand? She's not waking up and I'm really scared. He doesn't even move. I can feel my voice shake. Not acting or anything. I'm genuinely shitting it. I remember before when he was trying to help. That he kept trying to touch her hair and stuff. So in a moment of blind panic, I ask if he could move her hair out of her face so that I can check if he was breathing. I don't know why. I'm not as smart as she is. But I've seen too many crime thrillers and sort of assumed it'd be a psychology thing. Maybe he likes that she was vulnerable. Whatever. It worked. He got up deadly slow and moves towards us. He puts his hand on her hair and really starts smiling. I can hear him breathing. It's really scaring the shit out of me. Especially when he leans close and says, You're going to be my favourite. Annie has her eyes closed now. I put my hand on hers. And then I can feel it. She's squeezing. Not like, calm down, it's okay squeezing. But steady. Three, then two, then one. At once she opens her eyes and swings for him at the same time I do. Punches him right in the throat. And from where I'm sitting, I get him square in the groin. She decks him again like a boss, and I automatically grab his rope. He's not exactly going down with a fight, but between us we've got hiking sticks and massive boots, elbows and adrenaline. And in about a minute, we get him tied up. We grab our shit and get outside as fast as humanly possible. Then do something I thought I'd never see any do in my life. Call cool Mountain Rescue. They come get us in about an hour, and when we get down to town, we give a full statement to the police, making sure we didn't get done for GBH. A few months later, we find out that they let the prick go. He didn't actually do anything to us according to the police, and they didn't have enough evidence to tie him to any other sexual assaults, which is the worst part of this, because I can't even imagine what would happen if we didn't get as lucky? If Annie hadn't sussed him, he surely would have attacked us in our sleep. I've done my fair share of backpacking, an outdoor exploration. I am also a certified wilderness first responder. Well, one place where I went backpacking a year ago, the Wind River Range, has a pretty mysterious legend behind it. The Little People. The Little People are ancient Native American spirits who protect the old mountains. I believe of Alpache descent, and their leader was a crow. I first heard about it from a guy called Gary, an old instructor on a course I did, with NOLS last year. He told us about the stories of hikers who had been hiking, and all of a sudden, find themselves miles away from where they were sure they had been. He told us about how he and his wife had surely identified themselves on a map, on a certain ridge, as this man was an expert topo map reader, and then all of a sudden, found themselves on another ridge five miles away. The scariest story I heard was about a course where a bunch of the students were Native American, and during the night, they were around a campfire, when suddenly, all of the Native American students pulled out their knives and the instructors asked them what they were doing. Now one of them said, Don't you see them? They're all around us. Well anyway, usually I disregard stories like this. But the fifth night that I was out, 
They were sleeping in a row with three other people outside under a huge tree. I couldn't fall asleep and I was up until around 2am and I remembered the exact time because I heard three huge footsteps in a row right behind me. I froze still. I looked around in panic for a bear spray but didn't see one. I waited for what I thought was going to be a bear to make its move, but no more noises followed. After a few minutes, I finally worked up the nerve to turn around, and there was nothing there. I must have dreamt it, I thought, and in the morning, JJ, one of the people sleeping outside with me, said that she heard exactly what I had heard too, and when I had heard it. I don't really know what to think now. In May 2009, I had just broken up with my girlfriend of almost three years. We had moved from Calgary to Toronto, and were still living together after the breakup as we didn't know many people in the city yet. Needless to say, the situation was pretty stressful and upsetting. So, when a buddy I was going to school with at the time suggested a weekend slash camping and fishing trip, I jumped at the chance. He grew up in an area just an hour outside of Toronto, called Flamsborough. It's really beautiful. Loads of lush forest, farmers' fields and small rivers and creeks. We decided to camp and fish along a creek called Grindstone Creek. It's close to some wetlands and the fishing is supposed to be great. We ended up setting up our camp in what was probably a farmer's field, bordered by a gorgeous forest. We spent the evening fishing, shooting the shit, and drinking some quality craft beers. As it got darker, we made a little fire and roasted potatoes and hot dogs. All in all, it was a really good night. We turned in just after midnight. We shared a tent. My buddy fell asleep before I did, and I stayed up playing on my phone until around 1.30. I must have drifted off, because next thing I remember was being woken up by a high-pitched yipping type noise. I was kind of groggy, and it took me a moment to fully wake up. The yipping was incessant, and it sounded like a weird coyote. I laid there for a moment, listening, and then started playing on my phone again. The noise was annoying as hell. I tried ignoring it, but it sounded like it was getting closer. Finally, it sounded like it had to be no more than 10 feet from the tent. At this point, I was getting a little unsettled. I had seen coyotes in Calgary before, and I thought of them as pretty harmless. They never looked much bigger than a smallish dog, but what if this one was rabid or something? What if it could smell our food? I have a pretty bad anxiety disorder, so I'm prone to worrying about these things. I nudge my body to see if he's awake, and he was. The noise woke him up too. We discussed what to do about the coyote, as we hadn't brought anything to scare off critters. Not a BB gun, nothing. Finally, he decided he would shine the flashlight on it and holler a lot, hopefully scaring him off. He unzipped the tent and I watched him point the flashlight out into the darkness. I'll never forget what happened next. His legs suddenly went all wobbly, and he sort of stumbled backwards into the tent. He had a really dumbfounded look on his face when he looked at me and babbled, It's not a coyote. 
It's a dude. It's some weird dude. Normally, I would have thought he was messing with me. I'm a huge wimp and scare easily, and I won't even watch horror movies. But I'd never even seen someone look that scared. And I never want to see that expression on someone's face again. So I knew that he wasn't pulling my leg. The weird yipping and howling type noises were still going on. And in retrospect, it really didn't sound like a coyote. But I guess in our groggy states, it was a way for our brains to make sense of it. Anyway, he kept telling me to just look out the tent flap, to make sure he's not crazy. At this point, I was having a full-blown anxiety attack. My heart was racing. I felt like shit, but I had to look. So I slowly peeked out the flap and waited for my eyes to adjust. And that's when I saw him. He was standing only a few arms lengths away from the tent. He was swaying a little and wearing a baseball cap. And what made it awful though, what was really creepy, was that he was wearing women's lingerie. That's when I knew, there was most likely something very wrong with this guy. If the making high pitched noises at a stranger's tent in the middle of the night didn't give it away. After I pulled my head back inside the tent, my buddy and I discussed what to do. Finally, we decided to yell at the guy and just tell him to piss off. My buddy started by yelling, Excuse me, can you piss off? We're trying to sleep here. The noise stopped. It was dead silent. And that's when we heard footsteps running towards our tent. They stopped right outside the tent. But we didn't waste any time. We started yelling again. Seriously, piss off. We have cell phones in here. If you don't, we're going to call the cops. With that, we heard him walk by our tents and head off. Sounded like he was moving towards the road. Needless to say, we laid awake petrified until the first sign of sunlight. And then we hightailed it the hell out of there. We discussed our experience on the way home. And we were both pretty embarrassed about how scared we got. It definitely wasn't too manly on either part. I think because we both were ashamed of how we let some weirdo freak us out so much. But then again, we have no idea what his intentions truly were. And if we hadn't have woken up and confronted him about it, who knows how close he would have got or what he would have done when he reached the tent. It's something I try not to dwell on. I am a 19 year old female and I love camping. Anytime my friends and I come home from college, we would load up our coolers with beer, grab some gear and go screw around outside. Unfortunately, when I was actually at school, none of my sorority sisters or other friends ever wanted to go with me so I would often suffer withdrawal from camping. One day, the weather was way too nice to waste. So I grabbed some of my gear, hopped in a car that I borrowed from a buddy, and drove to a spot that was secluded, yet within safe distance to civilization, that I could run from and get help if need be. Camping also creeps me out sometimes, but that creepy feeling is also somewhat of a plus for me. It's the same reason that people listen to these stories. It's fun to be scared. So I make a little camp and get a fire going. I hadn't bought all that much to eat, but I was enjoying myself, reading and looking around the area, that sort of thing. I got the feeling all of a sudden that I was being watched and I stopped dead in my tracks, and I hear a twig crunch over to my right. 
Then I see a doe bolt from a hundred feet or so in front of me. I laughed at myself and went back to the camp with the armful of wood that I had gathered. I kept freaking myself out, hearing sounds just outside of the ring of light cast by the fire. I always get inside my head, so I shrugged it off, and I kept whittling at a stick I had been messing with. Around one, I decided to go to my tent and snuff out the lantern. I had been slamming beers in the most unladylike fashion and smoking cheap cigars, so I passed out relatively quickly. At around 2am though, I started hearing footsteps and they sounded pretty light and sort of timid. I think to myself that it's a deer or another animal, most likely raccoons, because I had probably left some food out. I'm still on my guard though. About 30 minutes of sleeping with one eye open, I hear a rubbing noise, and the tent fabric is being pushed a bit. I don't know how I didn't ship my sleeping bag, but I just sat there paralysed, with my KA bar in my hand. I desperately wanted to thrust the knife through the tent fabric, but I was still holding out hope that it was one of my buddies from a frat joking with me. And then, as suddenly as it begun, it all stopped. I was starting to feel slightly more secure, because daylight would be coming in about two or three hours, but I sure as shit wasn't be going to sleep. All of a sudden, at around four o'clock, I realised I should put my boots on, so that if anything did happen, I would be ready. After having stayed up, and keeping alert a little while longer, my friend's car alarm goes blaring. I freak the hell out and run out of the tent. I got about two steps before something grabs me around the mouth. I open my mouth to scream, but instead, the person's pinky finger slipped between my teeth. I heard that people can perform superhuman feats when they have a huge wave of adrenaline. In my case, I just clamped down, and there's no way to say this without sounding ridiculous, but his finger popped off. He screamed, pulled his hand away with the missing digit, falling to the ground. He took off running down the hill I was camping on, and took off quick in the opposite direction. I must have looked ridiculous to the people whose house I ran to. A little sorority girl in a wife beater, boxers and steel toe cap boots. I also had blood that was oozing out of my lip. Not from the finger, but because I'd also managed to take a pretty good chunk out of my lip as well. I told them what happened, and they called the police. Got me some real clothing, and the man at the house made me a whiskey and coke. When the cops got there, they checked it out. The cops went to check it out, and when they came back, it was light out. They brought me back so that I could get my friend's car, and what I found made me scared. Right next to the tent was a red gas can. He could have just lit me on fire earlier. The finger was also gone, suggesting he had come back. The kicker is they never caught the guy, so somewhere out there, the man is sitting down to dinner, maybe alone, maybe with a wife and family and a couple of kids, and he's missing his right pinky. I have many strange stories as I spend a lot of time in the wilderness, often alone, but this one just happened a few weeks ago and was absolutely crazy. I am recounting this with chills running through my body, and goosebumps, even thinking about it. I like to camp at a lake in northern Arizona that is rather remote. My favourite spot is on a finger bluff, with cliffs on both sides, and a lake, creek, and rich wildlife zones below. This area is home 
to the most wildlife in Arizona. Elk, deer, bear, wildcat, wild turkeys and porcupines. A few times at this site, we had headed off for day hikes or to go to a lookout point and return to camp to find a pungent stench hanging over the site. I would describe it as a mix between cow or horse and horse sweat, like when you take that saddle off on a hot day. With a little bit of skunkiness, I know what elk and bear smell like, but I can't explain this smell. This happened multiple times on different trips, and the strangest part is that the smell has always gone a minute or two before returning to camp. Anyway, a few weeks ago, my good friend and I decided to go camping at that spot last time on a whim. I needed to spread some of my dog's ashes in the area. We started packing up at around 7pm Friday, and were just getting into the off-road section by around 2am. It started snowing, nearly blizzard conditions once we get off road. It was so bad that we had to go about 10 miles an hour because the snow was blowing sideways and we could not see to navigate. It was sticking and getting deeper by the minute. We were going rather deep in and doing some serious 4 by 4 We knew that we may be stuck at the spot for a few days, but we had everything we needed. We arrive at camp at around 3am and get our tents set up. The snow had stopped for now and we were standing in a winter wonderland lit brightly by the moonlight. We decided to walk 30 or 40 feet out of camp to the cliff edges to look at the lake before bed. The lake tapers into a creek, a lush wildlife zone about a thousand feet below us. This is Arizona, so to see the lake in the snow is a real treat that I hadn't experienced before. We are standing there in complete eerie silence, the kind that you only find in the snow, admiring the beauty of nature and talking about how lucky we are to actually be there while sipping our beers. We notice the echo off the opposite cliffs, in the silence, about half a mile away. So naturally, I let out my best rendition of a Bigfoot war cry. My body follows suit. We both get a few out. When mid-war cry, my friend is cut off by a blood curdling Manalian scream from behind us. On the other side of camp, maybe 200 feet away. There is an extremely rugged cliff on that side, leading down to the creek and marsh area. I've heard elk, as well as wild turkey from the area. Now here is where my hair is standing up as I say this. Before I can even process what we just heard, Something very large and heavy jumps into the lake or creek below us with a loud thump and splash as if someone did a cannonball and then bobbed back up to the surface. There's a delay and then something starts kicking and splashing violently, swimming across the water towards us. Like you could clearly hear the legs kicking as a human. Very powerful. You could hear the concussion in the water with each kick. It sounded like a 500 pound man who was a poor swimmer, fully clothed with boots swimming. There was no delay in any of the actions. It was very deliberate and obvious that it was coming directly towards us. The splashing continues for a few moments. Then we hear it reach our side of the water and without any delay, you hear the dripping and the river rocks clinking as it gets out of the water and immediately starts smashing through the brush towards us at a constant pace. At this point, we look over at each other and can't believe what's happening. 
My friend already has his pistol holstered on his belt, but mine was back in the truck. Breaking limbs soon gave way to the sound of something scrambling over boulders as it made its way up the hill towards us. We stood there as long as we could, until it was obvious that it was closing in on us within a minute or so. I was no longer comfortable being there unarmed, so we both bailed back up to camp to get my gun. We stood around for a while longer in complete silence, trying to hear anything, waiting for something to happen. Nothing did, and we headed to bed around 4am, and the rest of the trip was uneventful. What animal at 3am, just after a blizzard, with a few inches of snow on the ground, jumps completely into freezing water and moves directly towards humans screaming loudly in the night? That's what I want to know, and I can't explain it. My only explanation is that maybe if a predator was chasing something, that could be it. But why would it run up a nearly vertical 1000 foot hill climb towards shrieking humans? It would be the hardest and most challenging route for it to take to escape the predator. And there also doesn't explain the other howl and scream we heard, or why this thing sounded obviously bipedal. The area is extremely remote, and any human or hoaxer would have been in an immediate survival situation after going into that water. This happened on my birthday. I decided to have six of my friends around to join me camping. My house has a garden of about two acres. At the bottom of my garden, it joins onto a large area of woods. Also, the grass at the bottom of my garden is really long. Originally, I had wanted to camp inside the woods itself, but my mates were a bit afraid of the idea once they saw how dark it got. So instead, we set our tents around three or four meters from the woods in my garden instead. It was a small area where the grass wasn't long. We got the fire going and it was quite fun for the first few hours. Just talking shit and asking each other questions as all teenagers do. It gets to about 11.30 p.m. and I realize I had left my M&Ms inside. Now I couldn't just leave them there for them to eat themselves. No, I decided to head back up to my house. Before I left though, I told my friends where I was going and handed one of them my torch. We had about four torches between us, so I carried no source of light up there with me. I then leave and go up to my house. I grab my M&Ms and then leave again to rejoin my mates. As I get about halfway to the bottom of my garden, I see the perfect opportunity. There's a mown out path through the long grass at the bottom of the garden. I thought to myself that if I crawl through it, I could flank the little clearing we set up our tents in and scare the shit out of my friends. So instantly, I'm down on all fours being as quiet as possible. I reach the long grass and now I'm lying flat, using my arms to pull me forward. I get about four meters into the long grass, eight meters away from them when I see two of my mates stand up and start shining their torches in my direction. I start thinking to myself, what the hell? I haven't made a noise and it's pitch black. There's no way they could know I'm here. My friends didn't call out to me or anything, so I just assumed they got spooked and didn't really know I was there. So I carried on sliding my way slowly towards their tent. Before I carry on, the moan out path I was crawling on was at the back of the long grass. About one meter from the actual woods, the only thing that's separating them was a small fence. So as I'm getting closer to their tents, about five meters away, my friends proceed to do the same thing. It's about two who stand up and start shining their torches in my general direction. 
I'm still confused as to how they could have maybe heard me, but my arrogance just made me push on. So I'm getting closer and closer, still hidden in my long grass. I wait for my friends to go sit back down next to the fire so that I can make a quick dash to the tree line. My friends appear to be a bit spooked, and it takes them a few minutes to go sit back down by the fire. But this is ample time to make the dash for the tree. This makes a bit of noise though, and draws the attention of four of my friends as the other two were in the tent. I jump out hoping to scare my friends, but I'm greeted with disappointing sighs. I ask one of them, wait, did I not scare you? To which he replied, no, we saw you coming. A bit confused, I ask. How? He responds with, Well, we saw the light from your torch when you were in the long grass. That just sent chills down my spine. And my friend could tell that something was up. They asked me if I was okay. To which I responded, I don't have any light source on me. I gave you my torch before I left. Now my friend begins to get scared, as they were convinced they saw a light that appeared to be coming from the long grass. Although I did not have my torch with me, and I did not see any light. Meaning if there were a light, it would have had to have come from the dark woods behind me. To this day, I don't know what that light was or who it was. And honestly, I never want to find out. I was camping and backpacking out in northeastern Oregon, way out in the middle of nowhere, with 15 other people from my Boy Scouts troop, a little over six years ago. I was 14 at the time. The nearest town was around 50 miles away, as the crows fly away, and it had a population of less than 200. The nearest population centre you could call a city was easily 200 miles away. We were sitting around our campfire late at night, after a day of hard hiking in the early August heat, shooting the shit, no drugs or drinking since it was a Boy Scout thing. It was a couple of years before we got into that, when around midnight, we see what looks to be a huge comet in the sky. It just appeared out of nowhere. It was a full moon with a clear sky that night, and it was easily twice as big as the moon. So it was either really close or really big, or both. We all noticed this, this huge thing in the sky, and watch it lazily move across the sky, and are just sitting there in awe. It's actually rather beautiful. Then it just stops in its tracks and sits there for a good 20 seconds to half a minute. Just a very bright, practically glittering ball hanging in the sky, perfectly still. Then it broke into five smaller balls that darted into random directions at incredible speeds. Two went into the sky and vanished. Another went parallel to the ground and also vanished, and the other two shot towards the ground and vanished when they got close enough to the ground to be obscured by the hills in the distance. The hills were about 10 miles away. We had actually camped in those hills the night before. We were all sitting there thinking about what the utter hell we just saw, when another comet looking ball of light appears in around the same spot. It does the same thing, moving slowly, stopping for around 20 seconds, and then breaking up into smaller balls that speed off at impossible speeds. That's when this weird feeling I've never felt before and haven't felt since hit me. I don't even know what to call it, but it didn't feel good. Dread, fear, hate, anxiety, none of those are really accurate. It wasn't as pressing or urgent as those. It just felt wrong. Like whatever part of me that decides 
while emotions to assign to stimuli couldn't decide what to feel to assign this. It just knew this wasn't right. The conscientious around the campfire was that everyone was feeling the same thing. We couldn't exactly say what we were feeling. It just didn't feel good. None of us could sleep that night. We just sat in our tents. One scout wanted to start praying, but most of us objected. I never prayed before that and haven't since, but I just sat there with my hands clasped together, asking whoever or whatever was out there to please have whatever that thing was leave us alone. For the rest of the trip, we never went anywhere alone. All of us agree on what we saw, all 16 of us. Even to this day when we try and talk about it to these guys, everyone responds with, yeah, I remember it. Please, let's have a speak of it again. I don't know what the hell I saw exactly. I'm not going to jump to conclusions and say, yes, it was aliens, ghosts, or secret government projects or shit like that. Maybe it was one of those things. But I don't have a definitive answer or the proof to back me up. It's just left me baffled, as none of us have any idea what we saw that night out in the middle of nowhere. I love storms, as long as I'm under a roof. The thunder, the patterns in the clouds, and the electric charge in the air always make me feel very awake to everything around me. I used to be okay being out in storms until June 2014. I had a little pup tent, too small for an adult to camp comfortably. Unfortunately, when I went to a festival that year, I had not had a chance to replace it since I bought it. I wish I had, since I already hated it, thanks to the situation with the person I dated a few weeks previously. That week, we had rain and thunderstorms almost every day, and I got sick. So I was stuck in this little tent, too sick to really enjoy the festival. So imagine being stuck in a teeny space, one you were traumatised in, barely able to breathe, with mud sloshing around beneath the floor, bugs getting in, and basically a waterfall coming off the trees. But I toughed it out somehow, and threw away the tent afterwards. The year after, I borrowed a decent sized tent from a friend to return to the festival. There had been a bad storm the night before, and that had muddied the campground and brought down a young tree on a pop-up belonging to one of the setup crew. But Saturday was a mostly clear day, and 1100 attendees set up the little pagan village as we referred to it. The next morning the rain came. From like 10 in the morning on, it rained constantly. I had volunteer shift walking the site, making announcements. They didn't even send me out, because of how muddy it was. I sat under the awning while rain came down in sheets. I mean, it was so bad that we had to periodically take a stick and push it up to the centre of the easy up canopy to dump the water out the bulge, where the canvas was slowly being pressed down. It finally stopped in time, for me to do a little outdoor shopping at the vendors. I was there for an hour and thinking of finishing up and going back to camp because I was in some discomfort from a pinched nerve, but I had one more stop. When I finally found the vendor that sold the herbal oil that would have relieved the pain, I discovered she had closed up. I wondered why, as a breeze picked up and then my best friend came up the hill and told me he was heading back to our campsite because another storm was rolling in. I was annoyed, because the thing that would have made the trek back down the steep muddy Helesia was right there but out of reach. After staggering down the hill, through the tree roots and the mud, I collapsed into my chair in my camp, under another friend's canopy downing some water and waiting for the pain to dissipate. 
when these guys started shouting in the distance. They're called Guardians, and they serve as a combination of security and emergency service. Most of them were cops, medics, or firefighters outside the festival. Anyway, one of them stops directly in front of the group's tent where I was, and this is what he said. Everyone, may we have your attention? There's a storm coming in, and the creek is rising. Gather what you can and evacuate to the top of the hill. You have 20 minutes. Move your tents as best, or leave them. I was in so much pain. I approached them and asked if I could ride back up the hill in one of their golf carts. Sciatica is no joke. For anyone who hasn't experienced, it's like having a hot wire running in my case from either hip across the lower spine and down either leg. So I have shooting pain every time I move, and the mud made it worse. There was no issue with me getting a ride. So I gathered what fit into my bag and met a friend who worked as a herald or announcer, which is the shift I would have had earlier that day, if not for the rain. At the top of the hill, I went into a tent with some other people, just in time. The wind was so powerful, and the rain was such a powerful force as it beat down on the canvas that volunteer staff had to hold down the edges of the walls. And that was when I realised I'd forgotten to grab a photo album I always travel with and my favourite deck of tarot. I was freaking out. I failed to stop myself from hyperventilating as the thought of sentimental stuff I brought to this kind of thing disappearing into the creek. Everyone spent the night in chaos. There are stories throughout the festival community of the heroism many campers exhibited, helping people rescue vehicles and property from the temporary pond of the creek made of our gathering field. We had a flooding creek, a miniature creek cutting across the road and two ponds. The one in the field was nicknamed Lake Keys for the fact that complete strangers were working together to save vehicles from several feet of water. I think only one was completely lost, with a damaged engine and upholstery that had to be soaked and rotted. A good deal of small property was lost, but all the tents were saved from the lower campsites near the creek, including my own, and everything I had left behind inside it. The next day, everyone who had stayed at the top of the hill returned to their sites to fix tents and assess any damage. At a quarter to ten, the heralds came through announcing the daily morning meetups, usually a fun, optional gathering, but it was mandatory. All of us gathered in the circle, which had the fire they kept burning all week long in honour of the summer solstice. For anyone who couldn't manage the deep mud of the steep path, it was perfectly fine to set up your camp chair at the side of the active road, so that's what I did. I didn't hear very well, but I got the gist of it. The shower houses, which were not adequate for 1,100 people, had failed catastrophically. The sewage system vomited into the pond on the hill just below it, contaminating it and the mud surrounding it. In addition, when the town upstream had opened their floodgates on the creek, a great deal of farm fertilizer, meaning manure, washed right down into our site. There was also more danger of contracting illness because there were several pieces of glass and metal in the ground that could have surfaced in the mud and could have cut someone's feet very easily, even if they were wearing sandals. In the 30 plus years the festival has been alive, it was the first time ever it had to be shut down early. It took three days to release everyone in staggered waves based on need of what you had to be driven to the site. They were concerned about a biohazard situation, so they wanted everyone out of there. The following year, 2016, the festival moved to a better new drain site in downstate Illinois. The barn at the old site, which was considered a storm shelter, was smashed by a tornado the week we would have been there. I took a year off from going and returned in 2017. Halfway through the week, I spent the night at my friend's tent, and 
We were hit by a monster rainstorm that lasted all night, and we were worried about severe weather once again. I hated being alone inside a tent during a storm by then, especially at night. Nothing happened beyond getting a little water in my tent, which was easily cleaned up. And then one more storm hit. This time I went over to a canopy where some friends were and chatted with them while it poured. I felt like I handled that one well. But between dirt bugs and storms, I don't love camping anymore. Hiking and backpacking with two friends in Montana. We were probably five miles from the nearest paved road and had hiked about two miles from the end of the dirt road. The spot isn't well traveled and is quite nondescript, but we all enjoyed getting away from any crowds and being out relatively alone. So we always gravitated to areas like this for backcountry camping. We built a fire, hung out, and then piled into our tent. All is normal, and we hadn't seen a soul, or any recent sign of people anyway since we left the paved road. I have some trouble sleeping, and was sort of just laying there for maybe 30 minutes, and both my buddies were passed out. That's when it got weird. I heard from my side of the tent, a murmuring, which I was certain was a person making sounds under their breath. Didn't sound like real words, but almost like someone drunk and mumbling gibberish. My first thought was one of my buddies sleep talking, but I listened closer and it was definitely coming from outside. I woke up my friend closest to me and he woke up with what? A little irritated, and at that moment the muttering stopped. I shushed him and whispered to him what I'd heard. We waited a second, and it started up again, but seemed closer this time. He heard it too, but we didn't hear any sounds of movement. I can still hear the voice, and the sound really messes with me ten years later. He gave me the what the hell face and proceeded to gesture that he's going to unzip the door and see what's outside. Right as he starts moving the zipper, we hear what sounded like someone taking a huge gasp of air before diving into a pool, seemingly from what was on the opposite side of our tent where we heard the original muttering from. We both froze for a second. He pushed his flashlight out and looked in the direction and screamed, Who's out there? We didn't see anyone and never heard a single twig or sound of movement. By the time my other friend had woken up, we were still freaking out. We told him what was up and we took our lights out to see what the hell we saw. Nothing. We were both up there for a while longer while the sleeping friend was out again shortly after. We didn't hear another sound at all, and in the morning, there was no sign anyone had been there. We cut our trip to just that night, and moved back to a campground the following day. We still have no idea who or what was outside our tent. The only thing that could have even made a semblance of sense was an owl, bat or another bird. But I've spent many nights outdoors in that habitat, and I'm familiar with the noises. This was entirely different, and in my opinion, didn't come from any animal I'm aware of. It still gives me chills thinking about it. Bonus story. A couple of years ago, I went camping with my brother, an old roommate of mine. This was in one of the old national forests in Oregon. We were pretty high up, kind of near a ghost town, not really a dangerous area, but there are a lot of black bears and some cougars. I set up my hammock with a tarp draped over to keep the rain out. Then I got pretty drunk and went to bed. Well, since I drank my weight in beer, 
I woke up in the middle of the night and had to pee. I lifted up the tarp to peek out with a flashlight, and that's when I saw two eyes staring back at me. They were about 20 feet away. I was using on one of those stupid $2 hardware store LED lights, so I didn't throw a beam, so I couldn't see what was behind the eyes. All I could see was that they were far apart. My first instinct was to turn off the light and stay where I was, but I was so close, and then I wouldn't be able to see it. We had three guns, but I left mine in the truck. I came to the conclusion that the only thing to do was to stay perfectly still and keep the light on it so that I could see it. So I draped my other leg out of the hammock and was ready to bolt for the truck if it charged at me. I stayed in the position for what felt like forever until I noticed the eyes hadn't moved at all. So I took a chance. I slowly got out of the hammock and started moving towards the eyes, keeping about 20 feet between us. I was moving towards the truck. Once I got to the side, I saw it. It was a pair of binoculars, left open, sitting on a stump, with a light they reflected just like a pair of eyes. And in my half-drunk state, it never occurred to me that this could be a possibility. I put the binoculars away and went to sleep. I know it wasn't an actual dangerous experience, and I've encountered wild animals before, but this is by far the most scared I've ever been, and for the most amount of time. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I just wanted to let you know that next Saturday I'm going to be live streaming with my friends CZ's World and Lady White Rabbit over on CZ's channel for our monthly show, The Deadstream. Be sure to put it into your calendars. In order not to miss out, it'd be really great if some of you could come see me there. You'll be able to find all the info in the description. If you enjoyed the video tonight, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and consider subscribing for even more stories every day. Don't forget, that if you would like me to read your story on my channel, feel free to post it to my Reddit or send it to my email. Both of course can be found in the description. To maximize the chances of your story being read, please make sure to include as much description and punctuation as possible. But anyway, for now guys, I'm gonna sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.